The Avenger is Jeep's first mainstream compact SUV model, a small, fashionable contender that unlike most of its competitors is a bit more SUV than crossover. It sells mainly as an EV but is also offered in conventional petrol and 48 volt hybrid forms. Virtually all the Stellantis Group engineering here we've seen before but it's been delivered with a distinctly Jeep vibe. This Avenger was the first ever all-electric Jeep and at its original launch in late 2022 represented a key milestone for the brand as it aimed to become a world leader in zero emissions SUVs. Time to test it. The Avenger name was one we hadn't seen since the Hillman and Chrysler saloons of the 70s. A badge attached to the first of the brand's EVs, the smallest Jeep ever made, and a fresh entry point into the company's product range. Two larger EVs will follow it, the luxury Wagoneer S and the off-road focused Recon, as part of what will be a four strong lineup of Jeep EVs by 2025, with the whole range fully electric by 2030. Jeep still wants to sell you combustion models as well though, so the Avenger range was broadened in late 2023 to include a conventional 1.2 litre petrol model and a 48 volt hybrid. Whatever their powertrains, all Avengers sit on the same eCMP2 platform as Stellantis Group crossover cousins like the Peugeot 2008, the DS3 and the Vauxhall Mocha, but here that chassis has been adapted for greater ground clearance and a little more off-road prowess, even though the car will primarily be sold in front-driven form. It's built at the group's high-efficiency plant in Tishy in Poland and is positioned just below the familiar Renegade in the Jeep lineup. The Renegade, launched in 2014, was the first small Jeep to garner any sort of market recognition at all after two disappointing attempts at the genre in the previous decade, the Compass of 2007 and the Patriot of 2008. But this one sounds quite promising and will need to be to turn around this famous brand's rather lacklustre European sales performance in recent years. Prior to this car's launch, only around one in a hundred SUVs sold on our continent was a Jeep. And at the time of this car's launch, the mark had a minuscule 0.3% of the SUV market here. Only in Italy does the mark have any kind of volume sales status at all. Maybe though we were all just waiting for the right kind of Jeep. Is this it? Well, over 40,000 sales were registered by the brand before the car even hit the showrooms, aided by a prestigious 2023 European Car of the Year Award and the 2023 Women's World Car of the Year Award as well. But can Jeep values really translate into a small fashion-led crossover like this? And would you want it if they did? Well, for the answers, you'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test. There's a niche in the market for a small fashion-led SUV, particularly one that can be electrically powered, which when it comes to rough road prowess is able to ride more than just a school run curb. This one looks as if it might be able to do that and even in this front driven form has 200 millimeters of ground clearance and a select train drive mode system with sand, mud and snow settings. Do you really need all of that plus grip control and hill descent control in your trendy SUV? Well, Jeep's answer is that you shouldn't have to do without it in this new EV led era. But in the combustion period, we're just leaving, that kind of additional capability has usually come with various dynamic downsides. Is that what you can expect here? Let's see. Closely related to questions of ability off the beaten track is the issue of just how much of a real Jeep this actually is. Well, like the ECMP2 platform this car is based upon, all the powertrains in use here are shared with the Stellantis Group's three competing small SUV models, the Peugeot 2008, the Vauxhall Mocha and the DS3. If all we have here 
is a repackaged version of a trendy Gallic-derived hairdresser's crossover, this famous American brand really will struggle to maintain its fabled brand heritage. But the company says we shouldn't worry. Over 60% of the components of that chassis are apparently unique to this car. And as we've said, it rides higher using a set of gnarly drive modes that a 2008 Mocha or DS3 owner probably wouldn't know what to do with. Which the company hopes will distract your attention from those shared powertrains. Initially, there was just one, the full EV model we're trying here, which gets the latest Stellantis 17 module, 54 kilowatt hour battery pack and 400 volt, 156 horsepower electric motor driving through the front wheels. With all the Jeep style capability fanfare, you might reasonably ask about the prospects for a four wheel drive Avenger of some kind, but unfortunately the eCMP2 platform doesn't allow for it. Nor can that chassis take the 1.3 litre petrol engine based plug-in hybrid drivetrain used in the four wheel drive Renegade 4xE. But for its brand credibility, Jeep's determined that there should be an all wheel drive Avenger variant, which as we filmed, was being readied for imminent launch based around a Stellantis sourced 1.2 litre PureTech petrol unit and expected to offer around 30 miles of EV range. Perhaps more relevant to the likely customer base for this car is the news that contrary to what it said at this model's original launch, the company will be offering UK Avenger buyers more affordable variants that it isn't necessary to plug in. All, like the 2008, the Mocha and the DS3, use different versions of the 1.2-litre three-cylinder PureTech petrol engine I just mentioned, either in conventional form with manual transmission and 100 horsepower, or in hybrid form where the same engine gets paired with a 48-volt, 28-brake horsepower electric motor integrated into a bespoke six-speed, dual-clutch automatic gearbox. Technically, that Avenger hybrid setup is a mild hybrid one, but unlike most systems of that type, this one can operate on electric power alone for short periods of time, around 0.6 miles at speeds of up to 18 miles an hour before draining its little battery. That doesn't sound very much, but as usual with hybrids, this one's really more about the EV motor cutting in and out for urban use rather than extended periods of zero emissions motoring. Functioning with the motor cutting in and out around town, Jeep reckons that an Avenger hybrid could be running without troubling its engine for up to half the time on busy commuting journeys. If those sort of trips will be this Jeep's staple diet though, you'll ideally stretch to the full EV model that will account for the majority of sales and which, as I mentioned earlier, is the version we are testing here. This variant's claimed 249 mile journey capability between charges reminds us that small EVs have come on in the last few years, but still need greater range if they're to truly function as only cars in the way a slightly larger EV might. As in most electric vehicles, the published range figure is somewhat misleading, as achieving it would require both a Miss Marple driving style and constant engagement of the most restrictive driving mode, in this case Eco, which halves power output, capping it at just 81 brake horsepower unless you kick down. Even in the default normal setting, you only get 107 brake horsepower. You'll need Sport to get the full 154, and replicate the claimed performance figures, which are supposed to see the car reach 62 miles an hour from rest in 9.6 seconds. You might think that sounds rather on the slow side for an EV, particularly one that isn't excessively hobbled in terms of curb weight. This car tips the scales at 1,615 kilos, but that's the legacy of fitting an EV powertrain designed primarily for a super mini, in this case for a Vauxhall Corsa Electric, and Peugeot's E208 into a heavier, squarical SUV. Some similarly priced segment rivals have electric motors better able to shift a boxier crossover like this, along with a bit more alacrity. We're thinking here of the 201 brake horsepower Kia Nero EV or the 268 horsepower Smart Hashtag One. You'll have to decide just how much of an issue that is for you. 
To be fair, in sport mode at least, the Avenger EV doesn't feel noticeably slow away from rest, as 260 newton meters of torque is punched through the eco-conscious front-driven tires. But forward thrust subsequently tails off even more than it usually does in a small EV, and top speed is capped at just 93 miles an hour. This car's got quite a bit of negative press comment for the firmness of its ride. Well, actually, it's not that bad over most normal surfaces, but you will certainly feel torn up tarmac and speed humps a little more keenly than in some rivals. Try before you buy is the best advice. Presumably, this kind of firm setup is necessary for the somewhat irrelevant light off-road prowess Jeep wants to offer and for the kind of sporty style handling it thinks the targeted younger clientele will like. Sure enough, body roll is very well controlled at faster speeds through tighter turns, and there's a bit more steering feel than you get with this car's Stellantis cousins, though still not quite enough for our taste, but sufficient to allow you to properly place the car through faster corners. As usual with an EV, a bit of brake regen can help when entering fast bends at speed, producing much the same effect as changing down a gear with a combustion manual model. There are no selectable regen levels offered here, but you can engage energy harvesting by activating the B button on the transmission selector. For out of town highway driving, refinement is fine, though not as silent as you might expect for an EV, the boxy shape doesn't help the car here. And you can have a few automated driving aids if you stretch to this top spec trim level, or tick the right options box, namely an adaptive cruise control system embellished with lane centering and traffic jam assist, which enable the car to almost drive itself at highway speeds and in urban queues. As for the prowess on rougher surfaces that we, and Jeep, keep mentioning, well, it's easy to sneer at that given the kind of trend-led product this is, and it certainly wouldn't be much use for tackling the Appalachian Trail. But the brand claims this Avenger to be more capable off-piste than a comparable Renegade 4xE plug-in hybrid, which, perhaps if fitted with less eco-minded tyres than we have here, would make it a reasonably capable thing. Those extra select terrain drive modes certainly suggest that. Sand, which works at up to 75 miles an hour. Mud, active at up to 31. And snow, operational at up to 50 miles an hour. All are aided by a surprisingly sophisticated grip control traction system that keeps the front wheels turning when they would simply spin uselessly in the slush on rival models. On slippery surfaces, you can actually feel it moving power to the wheel with most grip. That high 200mm ground clearance is complemented by extra underbody protection, and it all means that this Avenger is far better at wading through flash floods than its class contemporaries. But don't get too ambitious, it can only afford depths of up to 230mm. There's a 20 degree approach angle, a 20 degree breakover angle, and a 32 degree departure angle, all equal to or better than that Renegade 4xE model. And unusually for a front-driven version, there's hill descent control, which operates at up to 43 miles an hour on a greasy slope to reduce the risk of slip or loss of control when descending a gradient of more than 5%. None of which, of course, will ever be tested by a typical Avenger customer whose likely SUV challenges will be restricted to speed humps, high curves, and multi-storey car park ramps. You don't need an Avenger if you want a small, fashionable little SUV capable of dealing with mild obstacles of that sort. But Jeep's hoping you might want one anyway. And they could be right. For some time now, there's been very little indeed that's American about mainstream Jeep models, and the Avenger follows that trend. It's the first Jeep to be designed outside the US and won't even be sold there, built in Poland and aimed almost entirely at the European market. Despite that, classic brand design cues are everywhere to convince you otherwise. The pumped up trapezoidal wheel arches and the shoulder line reference the Willys Jeep of 1941. 
the floating sea pillar is from the Compass and Grand Cherokee and of course there's the company's usual classic seven slot front grille though it's actually closed off cooling air directed instead beneath the front bumper. It was a challenging design brief for styling chief Daniel Calamacci and his team who were tasked not only with replicating Jeep's unique DNA but also with incorporating brand specific features not normally needed on a small lifestyle EV crossover of this kind like the biggest possible tyres and exceptional departure, breakover and approach angles. At only just over four meters in length, 160 millimeters shorter than a Renegade, this is the shortest Jeep ever. But there's plenty of pavement presence thanks to at least 200 millimeters of ground clearance, super short overhangs, and beneath the bulging wings, large wheels of up to 18 inches in size. You can pay extra to have this contrast colored volcano black roof as well. The urban jungle, this Avenger's preferred habitat frequently inflicts low speed impact damage, hence the 360 degree black cladding extended up from the branded lower side sills and to mask scratches and scuffs molded in color instead of paint. At the front, the bent over seven slot grille references the TJ series Wrangler and is supposed to protect not only the radiator, but also headlights, which only gain full LED beams with this top spec trim level. These LED fog lamps require a summit level of spend too, but all versions get this lower gray plastic skid plate, which wouldn't last long on the kind of gnarly trails this Jeep is trying to visually convince you it could undertake. Look carefully and you might spot a few of what Jeep irritatingly calls Easter eggs. Little hidden added design details like the seven slot grille motif on the front air intake and the wheel rims and in the corner of the windscreen, a tiny illustration of the designer's son looking through a telescope at the stars. The rear wouldn't be particularly recognizable as a Jeep were it not for the X graphic in these tail lamps supposedly inspired by classic X designated US fuel cans. These lights gain LED illumination with top spec trim. Finishing touches include a subtle roof spoiler and another gray colored lower plastic skid plate. Under the skin, the Avenger sits on the Stellantis Group's eCMP2 platform, the same as that used for segment rival cousin models like the Peugeot 2008, the DS3 and the Vauxhall Mocha, a platform formatted for the use of both fully electrified and combustion engine power. Given all of that handover architecture, the brand has done well to make this car as recognizably Jeep as it is. Can the same be said of the cabin? Let's take a look. Well, yes, you'd know you were in a Jeep. The three spoke wheel looks familiar, as does this lean dashboard supposedly inspired by the Wrangler with an upper part made up of a single horizontal function beam, which includes all the air vents, ambient lighting, and the central 10.25 inch Uconnect infotainment touchscreen that all Avengers share. Below this central features passenger and middle part is a very useful full width shelf, highlighting the interior's practically intended orientation. Here, as you can see, this function beam is finished in bright yellow, an extra cost option which wouldn't really work as well with a different exterior paint colour. And without it, the front of cabin experience lacks a bit of Jeep personality. There's not much to justify the premium prices Jeep wants to charge unless you splash out on the optional leather upholstery that features here. Certainly there are rather too many hard plastics, though the brand contends their use is intentional given that brittle surfaces are easier to clean than deep grain leather or cloth. Still, the big, chunky but unilluminated centre dash buttons will be easy to activate with a gloved hand and everything feels pretty solid. Above you is a rather old fashioned looking light unit, but the off-white headliner gives the cabin an airy feel and by the modest standards of the small SUV class, there's a reasonably commanding driving position. There's no transmission selector, as with Fiat EVs, you change gear via these fascia buttons. We mentioned this Uconnect infotainment touchscreen, which won't be compromised in size if budget restricts you to a poverty spec model, but won't feature navigation with any of the trim levels unless you pay extra for it, as we've got fitted here. Wheeled out by Jeep is the usual excuse that standard Apple CarPlay and 
Android Auto wireless smartphone mirroring makes built-in nav largely unnecessary. But the navigation apps you'll add to this monitor's application drawer won't be much use to you in the kind of outlying areas this Jeep is supposed to be able to take you to. Hmm. This display, with its customizable widget sections, is the same one fitted to both the Peugeot 2008 and the Fiat 600e. And the good news is that it's mounted high on the dashboard and hasn't been burdened with climate functions. These separated out to a row of piano-style buttons on the centre console. The other screen your attention will be directed to is the one you view through the three-spoke wheel, which will, as here, also be 10.25 inches in size, unless you're restricted to base spec, which gets it in 7-inch form. This displays key journey information such as speed, mileage, electric charge and ADAS system updates, and can also bring up information on media, phone, mapping and charge status and power flow. The left-hand power Eco and charge graphic doesn't really tell you much more than whether you're exhilarating or not. Drive modes display below the digital speedo surrounded by topography graphics in the middle and there's a large battery charge display to the right of that. What else? Well, even for very tall people, it shouldn't be difficult to find a comfortable driving position thanks to plenty of adjustment from the wheel and the six-way adjustable driver's seat. Disappointingly, though, the front chairs don't come with lumbar support on any variant, even as an option, but hold you in place through the corners with decent side bolsters. All-round visibility is good, thanks to the glassy body, the thin front pillars and the squared-off bonnet, which makes it easy to see where the corners of the car are when parking. Thick rear C-pillars mean your over-the-shoulder view isn't as good, but rear sensors are standard, though you only get a rear view camera at the very top of the range. We mentioned the emphasis on storage space. There's 34 litres of it, over double the segment average. Enough, Jeep assures us rather pointlessly, for the carriage of up to 580 ping pong balls. Apart from the lower fascia shelf we mentioned, your main receptacle for odds and ends will be this covered central bin, which angles up towards the centre stack, and with 7.1 litres of internal space, could swallow a small bag or a large-ish bottle of water. You can specify a wireless smartphone charger to sit within it, which works well because with this neat, magnetically attached concertina ring cover in place, your handset is hidden from view, and you won't be tempted to check it whilst on the move. The front door bins are thin and the 11.9 litre glove box is halved in size by a fuse box, but an armrest between the seats hides 3.1 litres of further space. The centre console features movable dividers that can serve as cup holders and there are ticket clips in the sun visors. Right, time to take a look in the back. Now, you might worry about how suitable this car might be for family duties, given that it's 4,084 millimetres body length, 152 millimetres shorter than a Renegade. It's one of the smallest in the class. It's 126 millimetres shorter than a little Nissan Duke and a full 216 millimetres shorter than this Avenger's similarly platformed close cousin, the Peugeot 2008. Now, first impressions don't alleviate any of these fears. You gain access via this high-mounted catch and quickly find that the door openings are a little on the small side, which could make leaning in to a a child seat a little tricky. And once inside, well, Jeep claims that this car can take three adults across the back seat, as you'd hope a car of this price might. But as you'd expect with a small SUV of this size, it'll still be a bit tight for the middle seated person. The brand says it's worked hard on the seating hip position in order to maximise headroom that's helped by the Avengers boxy styling. But it'll be hindered if you opt for the optional wide opening panoramic glass sunroof. Leg rooms supposed to benefit from the careful hip positioning, supposedly also aided by the way that the 17 module battery has been secreted beneath the floor. But there's really not much room to stretch out at all, especially when you're seated behind a tall front seat passenger. At least the front seat backs are quite squashy, so if two adults are crammed in back here, they won't be crushing their legs against unyielding hard plastic. 
If you're in the EV version of this car, you might expect there to be a completely flat floor back here, as in Arrival Smart Hashtag One and BYD Atto 3 models. But the fact that Jeep's designers had to allow for combustion-powered variants has put pay to that. This bench doesn't do anything clever. You don't get a reclining seat back or a sliding base like you do, for instance, with a rival smart hashtag one. As for other elements of practicality, well, you do without door bins. And this USB-C port's only fitted above base trim. There are the usual ISOFIX child seat mountings on the outer two seats to add to the one provided with the passenger seat up front. You don't get centre vents, a central armrest or overhead reading lights, but there are seat back pockets. Let's finish, as usual, with a look out back. Now, you get this powered tailgate above base trim, which rises to reveal a 355 litre boot that's modest by class standards, 120 litres less than a Kia Nero EV, for instance. Still, you access the space via a low, 720 millimeter loading height, and there's a one meter rear hatch width. For reference, the slightly larger Renegade model offers between 330 and 351 liters of boot space, depending on variant. Here, Jeep provides what it calls a cargo flex kit, which gives you an adjustable height cargo area floor, but there's no significant space beneath it. Just enough for the charging cable, but certainly not sufficient space for any sort of spare wheel. You don't even get this puncture repair kit unless you pay £25 extra, which seems astonishingly mean for a car of this price and particularly inappropriate for what's supposed to be a reasonably capable small SUV. Five carry-on suitcases will fit back here, but a rival Kia Nero EV will take seven. There's no opportunity to take long items like skis because Jeep provides neither a ski hatch or a convenient 40-20-40 split rear seat back. When the seat back 60-40 splits down, it doesn't lay quite flat either, though it does release 1,053 litres of space. A rather unremarkable figure that Jeep attempted to embellish by telling us that it would be sufficient to take up to 2,443 rubber ducks. Should you have more rubber ducks than that to carry, you'll need to put them in a roof box because unlike some small EVs, this one doesn't offer any extra luggage space beneath the bonnet. So what will you pay for the Jeep of EVs? Well, that'll depend on whether you actually want it as an EV. If you do, then prices at the time of this test in autumn 2023 started from just under £36,000 for the base longitude version, with another £1,700 more necessary for mid-range altitude spec. And a top spec Summit EV model like we have here cost from a fraction under £40,000 at the time of this test. We're focusing on the front-driven model here. You can also talk to your dealer about a twin-motor Avenger 4xe EV variant, which hadn't yet been launched at the time of this test. You'll pay a lot less than is required for this Jeep in EV form if you want your Avenger with some kind of engine in it. The hybrid version, which you can't plug in, comes with the same three trim levels at prices starting from around £30,000. And if that's still a bit much, you'll be directed to a conventional non-electrified 1.2 litre, 100 brake horsepower, three cylinder petrol version, which will only be sold in a single altitude plus trim level, priced from around 27,000 pounds. For reference, as we filmed, Jeep's only slightly larger Renegade SUV model, priced in hybrid form from around 30,000 pounds, or in PHEV 4 by e guys, from around 36,500 pounds. Avenger pricing is crucial given the expected relatively young customer demographic. 20% of buyers are expected to be under 35 and nearly all will be new to the brand. Those figures see this Jeep pitched at a level pretty comparable to this car's close Stellantis Group cousins, combustion and electric versions of the Peugeot 2008, the DS3 and the Vauxhall Mocha once you've equalised equipment levels. A Jeep for the price of a Vauxhall? You might like the thought of that. If you're looking for a small hatch or crossover EV of this sort, for the money being asked here, you're also 
In the same pricing ballpark you need four popular class choices like the Hyundai Kona Electric, the Kia Nero EV, the Smart Hashtag One and the Nissan Leaf E+. What else? Well, we'd be tempted to save a couple of thousand over this Jeep and look at cars in this segment like the Volvo EX30 and the Cupra Born. Or spend much the same as Jeep is asking here on a slightly bigger model like the BYD Atto 3 or the Sanyong Corando E-Motion. The Volkswagen ID3, in case you're wondering, cost from around £37,000 at the time of this test. And Honda's class entry, the e ni one is priced right up at around £45,000. If we haven't yet mentioned the alternative you're thinking of, it's probably because it's smaller in size and battery, like, say, a Mini Electric or a Honda e, or sized and priced to fit in the next class up, like a Skoda Enyaq iV or a BMW iX1. If having considered all of this, you conclude that it is this Avenger that you really want, then you're gonna to need to know just how generous Jeep's been with standard spec. So let's take a look at that now. All models come with LED daytime running lights, gray skid plates, rear parking sensors, auto headlamps and wipers, headlamp leveling, an alarm, a heat pump to preserve your driving range in cold weather, and a very complete portfolio of camera safety kit, which we'll get to in a moment. Plus, there's cruise control and intelligent speed assistant, which stops you exceeding posted speed limits, and Jeep's select terrain drive mode system with grip control and hill descent control. Inside, every Avenger comes with air conditioning, a six-way manually adjustable driver's seat, heated mirrors, a front central armrest, and Jeep's cargo flex kit, which gives you a flat floor in the boot area. Media connectivity is taken care of by a 10.25-inch Uconnect central screen with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring and a six-speaker DAB audio system. The Avengers digital experience is complemented by Jeep Connected Services, a suite of functions that customers can access remotely via the Jeep mobile app. This allows them to locate their car, lock and unlock the doors, check the battery level, program the battery charge settings, and activate climate control all directly from their smartphone. What about the differences between the trim levels? Well, the 16-inch wheels and 7-inch instrument cluster screen you get with base longitude spec get swapped for 17-inch wheels and a 10.25-inch configurable TFT instrument cluster if you stretch at least as far as mid-range altitude spec, a trim level also marked out by gloss black mirror covers and inside by part vinyl upholstery, a dashboard with silver inserts and a synthetic leather steering wheel. An altitude trimmed Avenger also comes with adaptive cruise control, a hands-free powered tailgate, keyless entry, single zone automatic air conditioning and a second row USB-C port. That leaves only this top spec Summit trimmed model, which is visually set apart by 18 inch alloy wheels, full LED front projector headlights, LED rear lights and rear privacy glass. Other Summit features include 360 degree parking, all round sensors, front, rear and side, plus LED fog lamps with a cornering function, welcome and leaving lighting, automatic high beam control, power foldable mirrors, heated front seats, an electrochromic frameless rear view mirror, a wireless charger, velour floor mats, and a 180 degree rear camera with a drone view. This top spec model also adds level two autonomous driving capabilities to the adaptive cruise control system, notably lane centering and traffic jam assist, which enable the car to almost drive itself at highway speeds and in urban queues. On to options. Well, the first thing your dealer is going to want you to do is to look at the various available extra cost packs. If you want to embellish the base longitude version, a tech and style pack adds 17 inch wheels, LED fog lamps, privacy glass, auto high beam, a rear view camera, adaptive cruise control, a frameless auto dimming rear view mirror, and a synthetic leather steering wheel. For the two more affordable trim levels, there's an infotainment and convenience pack. For the base model, this adds keyless entry, a second row USB-C port, wireless phone charging, rubber floor mats, and the larger 10.25 inch instrument cluster with navigation. 
Navigation floor mats and the wireless charger are also added if you order the infotainment and convenience pack with mid-range altitude trim, along with a rear view camera. If you want an altitude variant with summit spec features, you can add an LED and style pack that gives you these big 18 inch wheels, the LED tech for the headlights and tail lamps, LED fog lamps and privacy glass. If you want navigation with this top summit trim, you'll have to add the infotainment pack we've got fitted here. And all Avengers can be specified with a winter pack, which adds heated front seats, a windscreen wiper, de-icer and velour floor mats. Most customers are going to be spending extra on paint work. Metallic shades like the sun yellow finish we have here cost 700 pounds more or 1100 more if you combine them with a volcano colored black contrasting roof as here. This test car also has the optional leather upholstery and if you wish you can specify powered front seats, front fog lights, an opening glass sunroof and even the yellow colored dashboard insert fitted to the car we have here. You can individually add front fog lights and either 17 or 18 inch wheels if your chosen Avenger variant doesn't have them. And around 100 accessories are available, including graphics for the roof and flanks. This should mean that it'll be easily possible to ensure that your Avenger looks like no other. You can also add a dog guard, rubber mats, and a reversible luggage compartment tray, as well as the usual roof crossbars, so you can add roof boxes, bike racks, and ski carriers. Safety kit includes features like autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist recognition, traffic sign recognition, lane departure warning, a lane support system and driver attention assist. Along with the level two autonomous driving features we mentioned earlier, Summit Spec adds an urban blind spot monitor, all of which can also be added to a mid-range altitude spec model as part of an optional ADAS pack. And passive safety features fitted across the range include six airbags and the usual electronic assistance for braking, traction and stability control. you the driving range figure from the EV model's 54 kilowatt hour battery, 51 kilowatt hours of which is usable, in our driving section, 249 miles. Though Jeep claims that this could rise to as much as 342 miles in urban driving conditions. Bear in mind though, as we pointed out in our driving section, that getting anywhere near to this will require the regular engagement of an eco drive setting that nearly halves the available power from the electric motor. Energy efficiency is rated at five miles per kilowatt hour. The Avenger EV comes with 100 kilowatt rapid charging capability, so its battery can recharge from 20 to 80% in 24 minutes via a 100 kilowatt mode four cable when hooked up to a suitably rapid charger. Just three minutes on such a fast charger would add 19 miles of range and 24 minutes could get the battery from 20 to 80%. When AC charging from home with a typical 7.4 kilowatt wall box, you'll need seven and a half hours for a full charge or around five and a half hours at an 11 kilowatt charge point. At the time of this film in autumn 2023, based on an average electricity rate of 30 pence per kilowatt hour, topping up this EV Avenger from home would cost you around 15 pounds it'd be closer to 36 pounds using a DC rapid charger. Still, either way, that's a lot cheaper than a tank of petrol. Charging is one of the things you can control from the provided energy section of the center screen if you don't want to do it via the Jeep mobile app. That energy section also has a selectable statistics screen which shows your energy consumption over the last 30 minutes in this EV model in miles per kilowatt hour. There's also an energy flow meter. If though you'd still prefer to be slugging in a tank of petrol, you'll need to know about the efficiency of the combustion versions. Well, the conventional 1.2 litre petrol model should return around 50 miles per gallon and about 125 grams per kilometre of CO2. For the hybrid model, think closer to 55 MPG and 120 grams per kilometre. Away from powertrain efficiency, Jeep's also given some thought to how to reduce damage caused by low speed impacts, which make up around 70% of accident cases in Europe. 
With that in mind, the Avenger's headlamps are encased and positioned high up away from low speed impacts. And the skid plates are made of a polymer mold, which doesn't show visible scratches. In exposed areas like the doors, cladding set high to offer extra protection. And thanks to these additions, the brand estimates the customer could reduce potential accident damage costs by up to around a thousand pounds. Like other Jeep models, this one comes with a dedicated Jeep customer care service where a team of expertly trained agents will be available 24-7 to answer any questions about your journey. Residual values look promising. Industry experts cap predict a 46% return after three years and 60,000 miles, a figure so good that the Avenger won the Auto Vista Group Small SUV Residual Value Award in 2023, beating 26 segment rivals. It'll be 54% after three years and 36,000 miles. To put that into perspective, over the same period, a Hyundai Kona electric retains 50% and a Peugeot E2008 just 40%. The insurance groupings, either 24 or 25 for this EV version, depending on spec, are very similar to those two rival models. Like other Jeep models, this one comes with a four-year warranty, servicing and roadside assistance package as standard as part of the Jeep Shield program. The Avenger EV's battery comes with a separate eight-year or 100,000-mile warranty, which can be extended by three years, should you wish. Servicing for the Avenger EV is required once every two years or 18,000 miles, whichever comes first. And that's considerably less frequent than most comparably sized combustion models, indicative of the way that electric vehicles have fewer moving parts than those with engines. Obviously no oil changes are required and regenerative braking means that the brake pads are designed to last the life of the car. As with other EVs, until 2025, you won't be paying any road tax. You'll have no ULEZ zone or London congestion charges and benefiting kind taxation will be rated at a super low 2%. For a brand that wants to lead the all-electric SUV market, Jeep has had a late start, but we can now expect full battery models thick and fast on the mark for the rest of this decade, few of which will be more significant than this Avenger. It competes in a segment now accounting for 20% of all European sales, and the company hopes it will be key to correcting its lacklustre sales performance in markets such as ours. There's a very good chance that might happen. The brief here to create a fun, boxy Jeep that can be all electric has been delivered with the kind of flair likely customers will be looking for. And if you don't want an EV, the hybrid version's a potentially preferable alternative. Either way, the Avenger's select terrain system delivers the kind of poor weather driving confidence that most of this car's competitors lack. The fact is, though, that this attribute isn't one usually prioritised by on-trend customers in this growing segment. People are more likely to want space and practicality and a comfortable on-tarmac driving experience. These are both areas in which, to be frank, the Avenger falls short in comparison to its most obvious segment rivals outside of competing Stellantis Group brand models. If you're looking at this EV version, you can get a lot more power for this kind of outlay too. For all that though, there's plenty here you might like, and there's no doubt that the Avenger will transform Jeep sales presence in markets like ours. We can't help respecting the company for making at least some attempt to preserve traditional rough road brand virtues here, and in doing so, they've given the car a unique selling point in its segment even if it's not a particularly significant one. You could still argue, of course, that for all kinds of reasons, this isn't a real Jeep, but there's no question that it's really what the brand needs right now.